we've got one final session today, and it's the poster session. We've got a quick fire round, so I'd ask everybody who is going to talk about their poster for one minute to come and find a seat in the front, or very close to the front, because it's gonna be bang, 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 bang. So please, find a seat near the front, and as audience members, you can, um, you can remain standing and stretching, and you can just stretch to your heart's content until we, we find uh, our poster representations coming. Um, and I'm going to call them up, and I'll do my best to pronounce the names correctly. And I also want to thank Alexandra and Patrick, of course, for organizing this session that we've just had. So thank you both so much for a fabulous session. <laughs> And um, I, I also want to draw your attention to the fact that there will be a prize for the most phenomenal poster, in your opinion. You have to vote for that poster online. So please do that because they'll win a nice prize. I, I know what the prize is, but I'll perhaps keep it a surprise the prize surprise for a little while later, but I know it'll be, of course, useful to you all. So, without further ado, because uh, you, you are the next session, and between you and the end of the day, uh, where everybody is going to go and find some drinks. So, I'm going to call Juan Carlos Rano Romera to the stage, please. You've got one minute to talk about uh, production and characterization of fiber reinforced composite material based exclusively on lunar regolith simulant. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Juan Carlos Araño Romero. I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute of Material Physics in Space, at TLR. And uh, my research I uh, have performed was on the production and characterization of fiber reinforced uh, ceramic matrix composite, which has been made exclusively from lunar regolith simulants. So the motivation of my, of my research was the self-sustaining and sustainable production of uh, construction of uh, infrastructure on the moon. And for example, we require uh, rocket launch pads, also roads and some, um, some habitat. And for that, we only have the only resource on the moon that it's uh, the regolith. For that, I have been working since 2017 in uh, the Moon Fiber project, which was the, the aim of the project was the production of uh, this con uh, continuous uh, glass fibers out of moon regolith simulant and in order to find an application to this material we got in contact with the regolith uh, regolite project uh, DLR and we have been carrying out some fiber uh, so uh, fiber reinforced composites with the with different methods especially with uh, electric heated uh, furnaces and also with uh, concentrated sunlight. The results uh, you can see at the bottom have been quite successful. The fiber reinforced uh, samples uh, show a, a higher uh, compressive strength. Uh, this has been carried out on, on uniaxial compressive uh, strength test instrument. And uh, we can see that the fiber reinforced samples have um, as the uh, highest uh, compressive strength increase, uh, the young modulus is decreasing as desired. And uh, as the reference, uh, we can see the still reinforced concrete, which is, uh, has lower compressive strength, uh, uh, compressive strength uh, <coughs> mechanics. So I think that so far it's quite successful results and we hope to continue on our research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Next, we have James Cole, water extraction from icy lunar simulants using low power microwave heating. Hi, yeah, I'm James Cole. I'm a second year PhD student at the Yonkin University in the UK. So, my project essentially focuses on uh, water extraction from lunar simulants, uh, yeah, icy lunar simulants using microwaves. My poster focuses on uh, using low power microwaves to do this. Um, I've used I've, my poster describes uh, various um, experiments to uh, explore different uh, the extraction efficiency and the optimum heating time of this. Uh, but basically, if you're interested in a low power efficient technique that can extract water ice without the need for mechanical excavation, come check it out. I kept it short. 
Oh, wow. Gosh, thank you so much. <laughs> Well done, James. Impressive in its conciseness. Fantastic. Florio della Vedova, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Robex, Robex, Robotic Experimental Explorative Palettes in Elio for in, in situ. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. you go. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, so how was Robex ideated here at LuxSpace? So um, here in Luxembourg, LuxSpace develops and launch uh, a performant uh, small sat for commercial usage since 2006. So when our government launched the Space Resource Initiative, we indeed uh, started to having a look to see what kind of businesses uh, are planned and will be operated there. So our first investigations uh, led us to identify this fantastic central infographics uh, about the most profitable asteroids. And there we understood that most of them are uh, located in asteroids in the main belt. So we s investigated and defined um, a reference scenario. Uh, and there we understood also by uh, reading and talk, uh, talking about uh, with people in, interested in space resource mining, that a lot of space logistics is planned to be done there. And this for sure in the main belt will not be done soon with humans, and, but very probably with long lasting and autonomous robotics. Also, these people said to us that they're also around in the main belt they will not only go for extract uh, material, but they will also process it, uh, transport it, move it in the, in the rest of the, um, the, the solar system, uh, in uh, go and forth. And so there again, the need for long lasting autonomous robots. And so our question at that time was, yes, but how will we arrive to these long lasting autonomous robots? And so, for sure, uh, we will not start immediately for going there and experiment there. So we propose with Robex to do this with robotic experimental pallets in low Earth orbit, and this in order to demonstrate uh, in uh, whole security, in full security, and still at low cost, uh, how a long-lasting autonomous robotic operation will take place and technologies. So our Robex pallets. You see there on the left uh, side, three Robex uh, pallets that are uh, accessible only by uh, docking on birth or berthing. They are uh, equipped with uh, two robotic arms and they are there to serve your payloads uh, that uh, will be brought by uh, docking and berthing only. And uh, before we ourselves, we move to these three meter long, 1.6 meter uh, wide pallets, we plan to start with uh, a minimum viable pro uh, products. And here we have on the, uh, the right side, our two first um, uh, minimum viable, uh, viable products. Um, the, the first one with a robotic arm developed in Germany and a second one with a robotic arm developed here in Luxembourg. So what we will propose you uh, as a technology, a robotic technology developer is that thanks to our robotic arms, uh, you can implement there whatever technology you want, uh, especially to targeting orbital robotics, uh, targeting also the, the, uh, the demonstration needs for manufacturing things, uh, processing things in space, um, um, store things in space, um, refuel in space, every, everything of this kind for business purposes, obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really do need to keep it tight because we are running over time. Thank you so much, everyone. Next up, Simon Drake, Lunar Resources Registry, targeting and registration of resources. Have we got Hi, Simon? can you hear me? Ah, you're online. Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, the inspiration for the Lunar Resources Registry was from Space Resources Week in 2019. Um, it's, we've come a long way since then. We are part of an ESAPIC. We build a we built a lunar registry, which is part of a da part database and part of part maps. You can see below. Our goal is to be a registry of all things on the moon 
but also we have a commercial aspect that we want to be the bridge between ISRU operations and uh, terrestrial mining companies and also energy companies and infrastructure companies. So if you're planning a mission to the moon, you're work working on a payload, get in contact with us. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to put you on our registry of the moon. We follow the Out Outer Space Treaty and Artemis Accords. Um, and we're just hoping to be this bridge between the engineers and developers out there and uh, the terrestrial industry and make the moon a bankable planet. That's it. Thank you, Simon. Super. <laughs> Great idea as well. Uh, next up, we have Poria Eschiagi. I hope I haven't mispronounced that name too badly. <laughs> Reg one concept of a modular high volume regolith transport system. And you can tell everybody how the right way to pronounce your name is. Yep. My name is Puri Ashtiari. Uh, I'm a member of Moon Experts, a team of uh, students from RWTH Aachen University. The main reason that we uh, designed uh, Reg 1 was the Over the Dusty Moon Challenge announced by Colorado School of Mines and Lockheed Martin. So uh, uh, we have two subsystems. In our system, we have a horizontal transport module and also a vertical transport module. Uh, we are going to use uh, piezoelectric actuators to transport the regolith particles in the horizontal path and also void filling mechanism uh, to lift the regolith particles to our plant. Uh, you can see some of our fancy renders on this uh, poster. And we are actually, right now, we are building our parts, and uh, they should be uh, finished by, I know, in two weeks, because we have to uh, transport those to America to make it to the final phase of this challenge. Yep, that's it. Thank you so much. Next up, Raika Fier, Systems Analysis of a Shared Water Hydrogen Oxygen Infrastructure for Future Space Habitats. Hi, uh, my name is Rika Freer and I'm a PhD student. Closer, sorry, closer to the oh. mic so uh, everyone online can hear so you. So better? Yes. yes. Uh, hi, my name is Rika Freer and I'm a PhD student from the German Aerospace Center in Bremen. Uh, sustainability and sharing strongly belong together, so that's why I'm working on a shared infrastructure for water, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, this infrastructure um, will be used from the space resource utilization and the life support systems. Um, especially the water treatment holds a great potential to exploit synergies between these two systems. Um, but on part of the space resource, so the water which will be extracted in situ, only a little is known about the water quality level. That's why I'm running experiments on um, dis the dissolution behavior of lunar dust in water. And on my poster, you can find the first results on this um, experiment and an overview of the shared infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. Next, we have Miguel Gonzalez Santa Marta with the title Gather and Updating Open Source Solutions for Space Robotics. Miguel? Yeah. Hello, can we you can hear, hear you, yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Gonzalez Santa Marta. I'm a PhD student at the University of Leon. And well, uh, our uh, poster is titled Gathering and Updating Open Source Solutions for Space Robotics. Well, uh, for fostering space te uh, technology in European society and technological transfer between open source projects and commercial solution is a cornerstone uh, in the current European context. One of the biggest uh, challenges in this process is attracting people to space robotics and adapting current proposal to be usable for high school and university students. So uh, this poster illustrates at a high level our uh, learning experience exploring the set of public repositories aiming to release a road to a robotic environment easy to use, adapt, and deploy, not only in a, a simulated, but also in a real robot. Our experience starts with uh, some space robotics competition, for instance, uh, NASA Space uh, Robotic Challenge. 
we have used uh, the SOPI model, which is based on the uh, Curiosity uh, rover. A simulated version is uh, used in Gazebo, where elevation maps are employed to replicate sp uh, space worlds like the moon. We have also integrated several software tools so that a rover can perform localization and navigation. Um, finally, everything is open source released and is available in the repository presented in the poster. Thanks, you, uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Miguel. <laughs> Jens Grigolite, next, the ERIS initiative uh, as a proposed giant leap for European research on space resources. Yeah, thanks for having the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I'm Jens Grigolite from Freiberg University of Mining and Technology, and there's a huge opportunity now in these times as Germany wants to establish two new large-scale research facilities, each funded with more than a billion for a billion euro for, for, for the establishment, and after this, more than 170 million each year for operation. And we propose to put this money and, and, and this opportunity to research on space, um, space resources and to establish a new research facility, a re new research institute for uh, space resources research uh, in, uh, set up in, in Germany. We want to use the money to establish a research infrastructure containing, for example, a very large scale um, uh, thermal vacuum camber, um, uh, so a dirty vacuum camber um, with uh, a volume of more than 10,000 cubic meters and also a closed loop habitat um, simulator system for uh, developing all the um, habitat technologies. And uh, you could use this facility to simulate whole missions and to have a systemic uh, technology development. And we think that this would be a very good opportunity because we would employ almost 1,000 uh, scientists in this center and this would bring uh, the research and, and space resources really forward, if you think. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Jim is up next. Jim Hondros, or Hondros, a proof concept resource development mission. Jim? Hondros? Um, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. Yes, sorry if it's I mispronounced awesome. your you surname. Uh, no, no, it's Hondros, so you're close enough. So good afternoon, everyone. And let me uh, warn you that this is a bit of a pitch. On behalf of my colleague, Mark Sondra, and I would like to thank the opportunity to present. Our background is uh, earth resource development industry. Mark was involved with deep space industries for many years, but he has 45 years in, uh, experience in the industry. And I've been involved now for more than 38 years. Our experience has covered operations, corporate project development, community relations, project risk management and approvals. And we've worked in many different types of mining, including underground, open cut, in situ leak, sand mining, oil extraction, and various minerals. We know that for commercial earth resource development, getting a project into production uses a gated approach based on risk management and mainly managing the financial risk. And we see that the earth resource development methods and processes as being entirely applicable to resource development in space. Our post was about our proposed proof of concept mission for such a project. But our point of difference is that it will be a mission to DEMOS to obtain a bulk sample of up to 50 kilograms of regolith for return to Earth orbit for analysis. We have our draft concept study and we are looking for partners. Hence my original warning about this being a pitch. If you're interested in hearing more, please refer to our emails and our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Next, it's Maxime's turn. Maxime Hubert de Lisle. Uh, again, I've probably mispronounced the name there. I'm ever so sorry. This is partly the hardest part of my job. <laughs> Thank you so much. The best space resource is the one you can catch and reuse. Exactly. Hello, everyone. I'm Maxime. I'm from the Space Robotic Research Group of the University of Luxembourg. And today, I'm going to tell you that the best space resource is the one you can catch and reuse. Space debris is a problem today. These are statistical models estimates the number of debris around 130 million, and that number is increasing exponentially, which makes space unsafe. There is then an actual potential to reuse and recycle these debris, if we catch them the right way. Autonomous capturing is a challenge also, especially if you don't want to harm the debris. 
So that's why with SpaceT, we are developing and designing a two-step capturing mechanism with a first step, a soft capture that would absorb the impact and then a hard capture that would secure the link between the chaser satellite and the debris. This technology would open the door to advanced opportunities and would uh, advance opportunities for space resource utilization, sorry. And many subsystems can get gathered using this new active debris space removal system and this will bring two major uh, effects. First, making space safer and cleaner and then giving access to a huge amount of reusable and recyclable resources. Thank you. Thank you, Maxime. Luca, Luca Kivit, trade-off and optimization for thermal lunar water extraction. And given that I don't know what country people come from, I'm, I'm doing my best with your surnames. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, the Netherlands originally. You may need to move the microphone slightly towards you because you're one of the taller people today. Yeah. <laughs> it's the problem with my people. <laughs> so hello there everyone. My name is Luca Kiwi. Um, I'm a PhD student at the DLR in Bremen. I'm part of the newly formed SMU research group which aims to combine uh, ISRU and life support systems. Um, however, my, re my research is completely in the uh, water extraction business. Um, right now I'm working on assessing different methods for water extraction and eventually performing a trade-off so to see what method is the best in what scenario. Um, eventually I want that trade-off to lead into a prototype that will be tested where we, uh, where we have some uh, plants to do um, cryogenic cooled uh, deep vacuum test with a couple of uh, grams, uh, kilograms of regolith with um, granular ice mixed into it. Um, yeah, so right now my poster is essentially my uh, research proposal. So yeah, I promise next year that I'll come back with some results. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Charis is next, Charis Cosmas, low-cost uh, low lunar cargoes, Oplonas and Macedonas. Charis, can you hear me? Hello, Charis. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon. I present in this paper two simple concepts, uh, patent pending, in which we can achieve lunar landing of cargo in very low cost by eliminating the need for fuel. In the concept with the acronym OPLONAS, which is about oversized payload landing on the surface of the moon, I present a spacecraft which will have a diameter of 60 meters and rotate at a revolution of 8.62 revolutions per second. This is a very fast revolution rate, which is to the limit of the mechanics of the strength of commercially available tethers, and in particular, xylem. By doing so, designing such a spacecraft and landing it on the surface parallel to the surface in a small angle, we can exploit the flat areas of the lunar surface in order to decelerate this spacecraft using the roll friction and not displacement friction, which would destroy it. The other concept with the acronym Macedonas is about capturing small parcels by absorbing their kinetic energy in a gradual manner. A small catcher will initially mechanically capture the parcel and will gradually decelerate it by the use of a kind of tether, which tight tether will follow uh, a trajectory and along this trajectory engage additional tether segments in order to gradually decelerate. These concepts are complementary one to the other. The first one uh, needs flat areas in order to land, and it is for oversized cargo. The second one is for small parcels, 
and can be implemented anywhere on the surface of the moon. Another connection of the two is that the second can be constructed by reusing the tethers from the first vehicle, Oplonus. So one has to see the two, two elements as a system, one complementary to the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charis. And now I welcome Victoria Levy, who's going to talk about development of a CubeSat system to supplement lunar prospecting missions. There we go. Thank you for the introduction. And I didn't fall up the stairs, so good start. <laughs> um, so I'm Victoria Levy, and I am currently a PhD student with the Open University in the UK. Um, this project is, is very new, so this sort of serves as a kind of introduction to the work that I will be doing. And then there will be updates, no doubt, at conferences and, and meetings to come that you can, you can look out for. Um, so essentially, my research is in the development of a small-scale, CubeSat-compatible, magnetic sector mass spectrometer type system. That was a mouthful. Um, which can be deployed on the lunar surface. It will be something which is low cost, low mass, easily replicable and it will be optimized to work with all different kinds of terrains. So you can basically pop them anywhere, hopefully really easily, really cheaply, um, and they should be able to give some preliminary data um, that will feed back into the kind of objectives um, that we're aiming to hit. So on the ISRU side, um, what it would be going to do is to analyze the regolith for useful things, useful volatiles, water in particular, we'll be looking at. And on the science side of things, it will be aiming to hit some really simple science objectives as, as well. So while we've got the opportunity to have access to this pristine material, one of the things we're gonna look at in the first instance is hydrogen isotopes, but there's the possibility to kind of extend and to um, make adjustments to, to different kind of science criteria as well. So watch this space, this is just kind of the beginning, as I said, and that is my everything. That's Thank me. you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Next, we have Xiao Li, exploring NVIDIA Omniverse for future space resource missions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad that I'm, a high, I'm going yeah. up for that. <laughs> so hi, everyone. I'm Xiao from the Space Robotics Research Group at the University of Luxembourg. So we are working on the project Helen in collaboration with the space team. We are developing a testing system for active debris removal technology, which combines software with uh, hardware. So within the project, we are exploring a media omniverse for creating real-time high fidelity simulations. On the one hand, photorealistic space scenarios will be developed using Unreal Engine. On the other hand, we will use the zero-g facility for hardware in the rope testing. Floating platforms and robotic arms will be applied to simulate microgravity environments. And of course, mathematical models will be developed using MATLAB Simulink, and the computational data will also be generated. Overall, we will use NVIDIA Omniverse to integrate those virtual and the physical components together in order to create a close to real testing environment. So that's all. Thank you very much, and uh, don't forget to vote for me. <laughs> Thank you, Shar. <Sarah. laughs> well, that was a nice little addition there. I like that. Very good call to action. Yes, there is an open poster competition for everybody, but that was very well put there right in the middle as well. You're sort of halfway through. Hugo Mahou is next towards resource-efficient lunar missions, a regolith-based construction approach. Oh, I do apologize. I've only got one name here, so uh, please. Indeed, we are um, just presenting quickly in you, one minute. You're a trio. That's OK. Yeah. You can be in charge of microphone levels, heights. So, um, hi. We are a team from Montreal who completed a capstone project under the mentorship of the Canadian Space Agency. And our goal was to automate the assembly of a lunar base that maximizes in situ resource utilization. Let you go on. So the regolith structure uh, is basically assembled by a rover around an inflatable module to protect against uh, external condition. The, um, the, the wall thickness reduces radiation dose uh, exposure to 310 millisievert per year. 
um, and, and give a protection uh, for micro uh, my meteorite impact. To validate the stability of uh, the, the, the lunar base, we determined the friction coefficient between two bags and um, built a lunar base mock-up. But the main challenge uh, remained to seal Kevlar bags and um, with high-performance polymers such as PEAK and PEI. So this difficulty is due to their high viscosity and melting uh, temperature point. So uh, our solution uh, is promising for two reasons. First, uh, the mass percentage of a regolith is 99.3%. And uh, second, it minimizes the energy consumption to build uh, the lunar base uh, because we only weld the sides uh, of the bags. So thank you and feel free to reach out to us and vote for us. <laughs> <laughs> you set a trend. <laughs> Dylan is next. Dylan uh, Mikasel Thomas. Uh, not quite the poet Dylan Thomas, but you've got, the, you've got that word in the middle, and you're going to talk about the exploration of seleno ten, uh, techniques and lo lunar regolith. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, thank you everyone for sticking around. It's getting smaller and smaller, but we're <laughs> here. Uh, my name is Dylan Mikesell. I'm from um, the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, and the title of uh, the poster is Seleno Technics and Lunar Regolith. Um, I just want to thank the conveners for bringing us here. Most of you have probably never heard of the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. It's a nonprofit applied research institute in Oslo. But for the last 50 years plus, we've been specializing in uh, geotechnical engineering and helping with design of infrastructure. So we have a project right now that's ongoing internally uh, at NGI, also funded by ourselves and the Norwegian Space Agency, looking at geotechnical properties of regolith simulants. Um, and if you're wondering what the term selenotechnics comes from, um, I think geotechnics is a little bit of a misnomer because we are interested not in the properties of these regoliths on Earth environmental conditions, but on moon. And so Selene is just the, the Greek goddess for the moon. Um, and we took that from selenophysics, who are a bunch of people, or selenophysicists, or geophysicists being applied to the moon. So we have a poster on our work so far. Come talk to us. Very nice. <laughs> Lovely use of words there as well. Next we have Rui Mura, geophysical lunar regolith simulant characterization, some preliminary examples of property testing. So thank you. I'm not Rui Mora, as you saw. Uh, so I'm Anna Pires. I'm one of the co-authors uh, of this poster and our research. Uh, I'm from Portugal, an do, emergent space nation. Do tell us your name, though. Yes, Anna Pires. Uh, and we, uh, we are from Portugal, uh, an emergent space nation. And I would like to thank you because I, I, we have learned a lot today. And I think that, uh, as you saw, with so many uh, future missions and future uh, projects and programs, I, I'm sure that some of our results, uh, they, they, uh, some, some of these companies could take adventure, uh, advantage of our results. And this is the case. Uh, our research is in line uh, with some of yours, uh, research, your own research. Uh, we, we, we know uh, uh, the, the main goal of, the, of our research is to characterize, to have a good baseline. Uh, this is the starting point, to have a good geodatabase of lunar regolith. And uh, uh, I work in a robotics and autonomous system laboratory, and, but my background is geotechnical engineering. So we are very interested in developing um, geotechnologies to, for, for future and for space exploration. In that sense, we are very interested in creating this baseline. Of course, the idea uh, is to test uh, uh, and to have these uh, geophysical and geomechanical characteristics and parameters in, in, lunar, um, uh, uh, in lunar conditions, but it, it's not not possible. Uh, so the, the first results and the preliminary results are very interested because you saw in our, uh, uh, along the day, in this first day of discussion, uh, properties like uh, magnetic properties of, of uh, regolith could be very interesting to separate minerals. Uh, thermal uh, properties could be also inter interesting to, when we talk about 
constructing and doing engineering in, in, in on the moon. Uh, also, uh, a seismic velocity of uh, this property could be very useful to understand the excavability of, of the subsoil. And electrical properties can also contribute uh, to the capacity uh, to, to penetrate in the subsoil, etc. So, as you can see, uh, this is, these are only the first results, the preliminary results. Uh, we, we, this is an ongoing research. Hopefully next year we could be here presenting uh, another result. And um, please, if you have uh, any questions, please go to, to our poster to find out more about our research. And please also don't forget to vote in our <laughs> poster. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. And thank you for your enthusiasm. Arturo Pajares is next. Martian regolith as catalyst for the conversion of carbon dioxide to methane. Okay. First of all, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I am Arturo Pajares. I belong to Flemish Institute for Technological Research, Belgium. And this project is carried out uh, jointly with ESA and University of Ghent. Um, so nowadays, uh, one of the most challenges uh, is to able to produce uh, propellant for return missions from Mars, because we can uh, carry enough fuel to go there, but not to come back. Um, if we use uh, in situ Martian uh, resources, we avoid uh, sending uh, materials from Mars, sorry, from Earth to Mars. Uh, one of them uh, is to use CO2 because it's the uh, major uh, component in the Martian atmosphere, reaching a concentration about 96%. As you can see in the poster, CO2 can be converted to a variety of uh, fuels. One of them uh, can be methane uh, through Sabater reaction. Sabater reaction is uh, the reaction of CO2 uh, with hydrogen to produce methane and water. Um, in presence of the catalyst. Uh, the catalyst uh, also can be, uh, one of the alternatives could be the Martian soil, um, as called uh, regolith, Martian regolith. And well, according to the project that we have, uh, we divide it in five uh, work package. The first one is the characterization of this uh, Martian soil, um, simulant, this uh, simulant. Um, we are going to submit it to different treatments as a thermal, um, magnetic separation or chemical leaching, grinding, or also the additional ruthenium. And we are going to characterize and the most, uh, we are going to test in the reaction. And the most performing catalyst, we are going to convert it in 3D, uh, 3D printing catalyst. And also we are going to characterize this material in the, um, for the reaction. And then um, we are going to test uh, these materials uh, for another reaction. This is the robeso Quatergachi reaction, which is the production of zinc gas. Um, this is uh, a building block for, uh, for the production of higher hydrocarbons and uh, oxygenate compounds that can be valuable for future uh, uh, colonizations. And finally, the, the last step of the stage of the project is uh, to quantify uh, the, how much uh, the materials and the energy that we will uh, require for these processes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Arturo. <laughs> Sebastian Rode is next. Sebastian's going to talk to us about the dissolution and el electrolysis of lunar regolith in ionic liquids. Okay. Hello, good evening, everyone. <laughs> I hope you're still awake. Um, yeah, so my name is Sebastian Roth. I'm a PhD student at Graz University of Technology. But actually, this poster is about my master thesis, which I conducted at the European Astronaut Center at uh, the Spaceship EAC group. And what we tried to do there was basically to investigate a novel method to extract oxygen. We heard a lot about that today. Um, and what we tried to do is to use the... Mm, the uh, remarkable properties of ionic liquids uh, for this process. So ionic liquids, if you don't know that what that is, it's basically salts that remain liquid uh, at room temperature, and they don't evaporate in the vacuum of space, and they have uh, good properties if you want to conduct electrolysis. And an advantage of this uh, process would be that it would work at very low temperatures, 
um, other oxygen extraction methods work sometimes above 1,000 degrees or, or like at least several hundred degrees. And this would work at 100, roughly. And um, it's non-toxic, it's non-flammable, um, and has a lot of interesting properties. So if you want to learn more about the results of this study, then come and meet me at my poster. And thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> Sean is next. Uh, Sean Salazar, a study of Norway's emerging ISRU landscape. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I'm Sean. I'm here together with my colleagues from the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. Uh, you heard from my colleague Dylan earlier. Um, I'm here to present our poster uh, that summarizes a study that we did uh, this last year. It was a desktop study, so not as technical as some of the other presentations that we've heard here this evening. Um, the study was supported by the Norwegian Space Agency and also with uh, ESA's PRODEX program funds. Um, the Norwegian space industry uh, as some of you in this room will know, um, has a very long uh, history in uh, space telecommunications uh, with satellite and ground station components uh, in Norway. Um, but we also know that uh, Norwegian industry has many decades of experience in resource extraction in challenging environments. So the goal for the study was first to map the potential for Norwegian actors, particularly from non-space sectors, to get involved with space resource utilization in the future. And secondly, was to raise awareness of ISRU and space resource utilization as a viable field for research. Um, to raise awareness of possible funding mechanisms um, that could be accessed by Norwegian actors and also for collaboration opportunities in Europe. Uh, as part of the study, we interviewed 40 organizations uh, from small start startups to research centers, uh, some of which are already contributing uh, to ISRU studies or that have the uh, ambitions to contribute to uh, future exploration. Uh, we compiled a report for the Norwegian Space Agency. Um, some of the highlights included um, RIMFAX, which is the, the GPR on NASA's Perseverance rover, which was developed by Norway's uh, Defense Research Establishment and the University of Oslo. Uh, NAMO, which is exploring hydrogen peroxide as a green bipropellant using compact engines. The Center for Space Sensors and Systems, SENSE, um, which is a research-based innovation center uh, funded by the Research Council and industrial partners. Uh, Clara Venture Labs, which is developing fuel cell technology for off-world applications. Uh, the Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Research in Space, Cirrus, which is testing life support systems for future missions. And many, many more that I don't have time to mention here. Uh, so after we mapped Norway's current and uh, future potential, we organized an SRU-themed workshop uh, in January. And uh, we observed a lot of enthusiasm for getting involved in space resources. Um, our goal is to now build a um, community in Norway that is interested in this topic and uh, our next event is actually next month at the Norwegian Space Agency where we hope to gather uh, those that are interested and uh, we hope to build a, a thriving uh, space resource community in Norway. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to seeing what Norway has in store. <laughs> next up, it's Hannah Sargent modeling dust clouds uh, yeah, hello, Hannah, sorry. Yes, mon modeling dust clouds produced from lunar rover operations. Hi, yeah, my name is Hannah Sargent. I'm a postdoc at the University of Central Florida, and this is a project that um, I started whilst I was at the Open University UK. Um, so we're basically looking at modeling uh, the dust that is kicked up from operations such as rovers or maybe even um, excavators, for example. And we all know dust can be incredibly harmful, especially to, um, to moving mechanisms. And also, we don't want dust collecting on other sensitive instruments. So um, we are, we've created this simulation. We're validating it by comparing it to footage from a high-speed rover traverse during the Apollo 16 mission. Um, so if you're interested and, and want to know, um, for example, what, what are the speed limits of rovers or what better fender designs you can have to limit the dust that is kicked up from your rovers, uh, we, we can run those simulations. Um, and also we're interested in um, how that changes depending on where you are on the moon and at what time. So during the lunar day, lunar night, or in permanently shadowed regions, uh, the electric field changes and that will influence uh, the dust cloud that's, that is produced because you, you've got these charged particles that are moving in an electric field. So yeah, come check out my poster, ask any questions. I'm also a representative of Exolith, so if you have questions about simulants, we can chat. And also for the Breaking Ground Trust, so we're looking to purchase regolith on the moon and develop policies for that. So if you're interested in anything like that, please come chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
I must say thank you to all of you. We have a few more posters to go, but you're all doing so well keeping to time, keeping it concise, because I know it's really tough at the end of the day, and you all want to go to the party. <laughs> Next, we have Jan Tommel, a mission to Mars using space-sourced propellant. Good evening, yes. Uh, so you have seen today a lot of studies on how to extract uh, space resources. What is the chemistry about it? Um, we took, uh, we, we wanted to ask the, the address, the other side of the question. Um, once you have it, is it useful? We say that all the time, but has somebody proven that to you? Um, so we were doing an astronomic study for a mission to Mars. And an example, we used the Mars Express mission and we had one of the co-authors is the actual project manager of ExoMars, so one of the maybe the most successful European uh, exoplanetary mission, uh, interplanetary mission there is. Um, so we're doing computations um, for the reference mission and then also for a mission that would, would go first to a depot location. And here in this case is L2, the Earth, uh, the Sun Earth L2, that is the third picture from the top and then you would be very on the right, it's not well to see, relatively far away from Earth um, yet in the vicinity. So we're computing how to get there to see what is the influence on the mission. Second, whether if you refill, whether it is useful. Um, we did that with a high fidelity software that is used by NASA, it's called GMAT, so that we are sure that our results are accurate, are scientific and uh, really reliable. And unfortunately, it's a little small there, but um, the results are very, very um, exciting and very, very promising. The first line in the table tells us that if you go, instead of directly Mars, you go to that L2 point, you need a much, much smaller launcher so that you save a lot of money there. Um, then the second line would tell us that instead of around 200 days to Mars, it would take a bit more time that is to be expected because you, now you have this gas stop. Um, and the third line tells us that instead of 113 kilogram of payload mass, cameras, sensors, scientific equipment, um, you could already discounting for extra uh, equipment for the refilling your, your nozzles and so on, you could have up to 323 kilograms of payload mass. In other words, if you refill at the L2, you could have three scientific missions for the price of one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, uh, we have Christos Tsaikaris. And I'm really sorry if your surname is incorrect there. He's going to talk about space resources for surgical innovation, the case of the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you very much for the floor. Uh, the name is uh, Christo Tsagari, so almost that. Uh, I'm a medical doctor from Greece. I'm currently working as a research fellow in the Department of uh, Orthopedics in the Baldur's Invest Hospital in Zurich, Switzerland. And in the future, I intend uh, to specialize in orthopedics. Uh, so, as you understand, uh, this poster is about space and surgery. What we know is that the first telescope was built uh, in the 17th century in the Netherlands. A few decades later, Galileo pointed this telescope skyward, and uh, one century later, the first use of uh, a microscope in medicine was reported. It took uh, three more centuries for lenses and telescope technology to be introduced to the operating theater. And uh, since then, of course, uh, both surgery and space exploration have gone to great lengths in their respective fields. And nowadays, with the development of uh, very powerful and uh, sensitive telescopes like the James Webb uh, Telescope, we should think whether the resources behind them can benefit surgery. To answer this question, we conducted a thorough literature search in peer-reviewed and great literature. We found out that there is only one application it is uh, in cataract surgery, this is eye surgery, and they took uh, the abnormal surfaces mapping of the telescope and translated it in an application to map the eye for surgical planning. Uh, this is important because cataract surgery stands for approximately 5% of all surgery performed. However, uh, the most commonly used surgical services are those referring to trauma and uh, malignancies and these services so far have not benefited from these resources. Combined, these two account for 10% of the global uh, burden of diseases which are treated in a surgical manner. As a result of this, what lies ahead 
is an effort to use this technology, to translate this technology into surgical applications in this field. This includes, but are not limited, to computer-assisted surgery, um, <clears throat> advanced uh, automatic segmentation of uh, injuries, of tumors, or bone defects, and many more that we may be able to uh, discover together and probably present them in the next edition of this meeting. So if you are interested, please reach out and we can collaborate on answering this question. Thank you again. Thank you, Christas. <laughs> and I have two talks here from Leonardo Turki. Uh, Omnicam being the first one, Omnicam Bifocal Panoramic Camera for Human and Robotic Exploration. And is it true that you have a second poster as well? Yeah. Okay. You're doubling your chances here of winning. <laughs> Let's start with the first one. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this poster, I mean, I'm Leonardo Turki. I'm a system engineer, and I'm here for introducing you to this poster about the Omnicam, which is uh, a bifocal panoramic camera for human and robotic exploration. The Omnicam is an innovative concept because it can capture using a single uh, lens and a single imaging device, a single sensor, both the surrounding of an environment uh, and also an optically zoomed portion. Uh, well, as well, the Omnicam can pan and tilt uh, employing a single motor, so leading to overall reduction of weight and reduction of power consumption. The, we employ an um, imaging device, an imaging sensor, which is compatible with uh, utilization in space, and we are looking for opportunities to raise the TRL of the, of the overall system, which has been uh, tested in uh, robotics setup uh, last year also at the ESRIC uh, Space Research, Research Challenge and uh, also in a uh, um, field test campaign. Uh, I can go on to the next poster. To the next poster. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. The next one has the title Swarm Based Monitoring and Multispectral Prospecting. Yeah, so you will see in this poster also an application of the Omnicam, uh, but the idea behind this poster, this concept of operation that is here, is for uh, having swarm autonomous robotics for multispectral prospecting. So basically behind having an heterogeneous, employing heterogeneous swarm robotics for having improved in situ resource utilization. Uh, the concept of variation behind this uh, envisages both having software and hardware. On software side, there is the it's a warm intelligent platform uh, that uh, handles uh, the, the, the dynamics of this worm. And on the other side, uh, we, have, uh, we mount on these rovers uh, what we call prospecting probe, PRP, uh, which encloses in a single device uh, uh, multiple instruments uh, for prospecting, like uh, spectrometer, uh, microscopes, uh, and, uh, and also 3D cameras. Uh, and then employing also machine learning for uh, completing this loop uh, in having basically in autonomous uh, operations because of uh, um, uh, autonomous insight on what's uh, in front of the rover. And this can be applied to, to multiple setups, not only for prospecting, but also for supporting human operations. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our final poster presentation is Ya Chung Wang, response of a lunar dust mitigation system under UV. Thank you, Lisa. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ya Chung Wang, and um, I'm a PhD student at the German Aerospace Center, DLR. And um, we've heard a lot today about exploration and uh, ambition in, in our space endeavors. But um, it is at the same time important to be able to sustain the mission. Therefore, it is critical um, to be able to increase the longevity of our instruments. Therefore, um, as part of um, an ESA DLR co-funded initiative, um, I am studying the um, yeah I'm studying um, lunar dust mitigation as um, part of a like a complementary study to, to um, space exploration. And um, yeah, so in my, um, in my PhD project, I'm conducting a parameter studies on various simulants um, in various environmental conditions in order to understand the behavior that might be 
um, related to, to certain characteristics of the, or, or the properties of the simulants. So if you would like to learn more, please um, feel very welcome to come to my poster and thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your hard work. And uh, oh, the lights are going out already. <laughs> it's been a very long day for you all, a very long afternoon. Now, I think you all know that there's a space cafe party on right now. So it's just three stops away on the tram. I'm sure as a group you'll find it. And uh, you can follow the Luxembourgers here who know how to get there, perhaps. <laughs> and um, yeah, if there's any other questions, you can go to one of the organizational team. And with that, I wish you a lovely, lovely evening. For those of you who are uh, here present but not involved with the posters, vote for the posters. For those of you watching online, thank you so much. And we'll do it all again tomorrow. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you.